Good morning. I know we've got a number of people on vacation and a number of people worshiping from home, so if you were online this morning, welcome. Um, it is an absolutely beautiful day, and it's good to see you all here. Let's stand in worship, shall we? Let's start with the opening prayer. You'll find it in your bulletin, and it's also on the screen. And if you're listening online, you can go to the website and download a copy of the bulletin there so that you can follow along. We praise you, O oh God. You have been faithful and true through good times and bad. Forgive us for doubting when we have not seen your hand at work, believing that you are too distant to care or too weak to act. Open our eyes, our ears, our minds, our hearts to the glory of what you are about in this world. Open our hands to receive from you this morning. Breathe into us the new life of your Holy Spirit, that we might be your ambassadors in the world. My God and my King, may you find my worship a pleasing offering, a sweet fragrance lifted to you this morning. Amen. Yes. 
His face shine upon you. Be gracious to you, O Lord, turn His face toward you and give you peace. Amen.
just hold right here with me for a minute and just pray with me? Father God, you are so individual. You are the God of the corporate. You are the God of the ecclesia, the church. But you are also my God. Just think about that and hold on to that for a moment. That the God of the universe knows you. He knows you as intimately as he knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows your strengths and your weaknesses. He knows your fears, your struggles. He knows your joys and your celebrations. He knows everything about you. The God of the universe is your God. Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning. Spirit of God, we thank you for moving among us. I ask you to be with us in our worship as we worship together as a corporate body. But Father, also, Spirit of God, move individual, individually with each one of us and meet that individual need, the need that we hold in our heart that we're not even aware of, that words can't even express. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for the privilege of praising you and worshiping you this morning. Father, and it doesn't matter whether we're here in person, whether we're watching online, we all are connected to you. One God, one body, one Father of all. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you, because I'm all hooked up this way. I won't fall down. Yeah, this is fine. Thank you very much. Okay, so this morning we're going to continue the journey that we started last week by talking about spiritual gifts. And we're going to be talking about the individual spiritual gifts at some point in time. But it's my conviction that as with everything in Scripture, context is king. Context is everything. And it is very important that we lay a solid foundation in understanding the spiritual gifts so that we can proceed in opening those gifts and activating those gifts and moving forward in those gifts in the healthiest way possible in the way God intended. And so we're going to continue our journey through um, the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and join me there. Last week we read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Today we're going to read 12 through 31, looking for more context in what Jesus was talking about, what Paul was meaning in the context of the gifts that, that God has given us. So if you're following along, join me. I'm going to pick up at verse 12. For the body is one and has many members. But all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Or if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, then where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, then where would the smelling be? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again can the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on those we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body, having give greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. 
And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and the members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, variety of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a still more excellent way. This is the word of God for the people of God. I think it's interesting sometimes how we... um, how we take things out of context in Scripture. A lot, this, this section of Scripture um, is not probably one that you're unfamiliar with. We understand the concept of all parts are needed, that every person in the church, every, every individual has a function and a purpose in the church. We tend to gloss over the conversation of spiritual gifts, yet I believe that it's no small thing that the conversation about one body immediately follows the conversation about spiritual gifts. Why? Because they're connected, and there's a point that Paul was trying to make. We're going to be uncovering spiritual gifts, but Paul is very... Um, adamant about everyone understanding the equal necessity of all of those for the healthy body, for a healthy and functioning church. And when all of those are given their due, when all of those are nurtured, and when all of those are on the same page and working together and operating in a healthy way, the church can grow. But all of those parts and pieces are needed. No more can we say, I don't need a hand, or I don't need a heart, or I don't need, I mean, just try not having one function properly and tell me for a moment that you don't need that part. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. The same with the body of church. God created us to be in community with one another. He created us each having an individual role to play an important responsibility, and in this context, a gift given to him by his own, given to us, by the Holy Spirit's discernment. You don't get to choose which gift you've been given. The Holy Spirit, in his wisdom, gives you a gift because he knows you intimately. He knows you better than anybody else does. He knows your capacity for growing and honoring that gift, right? And as equally important, he gives to each one different measure. (laughs) And it's not up to us as a body of Christ to point to another and say, well, they have a greater measure, therefore they must be more important than I. That's not true. It's not the way it works. God created us to need each other. He created us because he needs us to function as the church for the church to be what God intended it to be. And so that begs the question, what's the purpose of church then? Why do we come? Why is it even here? You ever stop to think about why the church even exists? (laughs) I believe that the purpose of the church is to give glory to God. It's to make manifest the kingdom. And we have roles and responsibilities in that purpose. Our purpose is to invite others in and help them understand what God has for them, their part in God's plan, help them receive forgiveness and redemption and restoration. And then once they become members of the family, our responsibility doesn't end there. Our responsibility to members then is to grow them up to become mature disciples. And our responsibility doesn't end there. Once we have people who are growing in maturity, then we start to open up and see and realize that we have responsibility. And that responsibility means we each individually have a ministry that we are obligated then to step into. 
So the purpose of the church, I think, is threefold. It's to bring in and to grow the church. It's to grow up the disciples in the church in Christian maturity, and it's to send them out into the world to minister the gospel, to do what they were ordained to do, the unique purpose that you are sitting here for today is to grow you up and give you permission and to, to help you go out and be successful in whatever ministry it has. It's never a question of, well, I have more than this person does, or I have less than this person does. It's about all of us act, being active together in, in doing the roles and responsibilities that we are called to do. And, and that begs the question. So all this act of bringing in, of maturing and growing up, and then of sending forth, whose job is that? And if any of you thought it's the pastor's job, eh, you're wrong. <laughs> wrong answer. <laughs> Repeat after me. It's my job. Say that with a little more enthusiasm. <laughs> it's my job. It's my job. It's your individual job to grow in spiritual maturity. It's your individual job to come alongside somebody when you recognize they need something that you can offer and help them grow. You don't, uh, I'm not going to make friends with this next statement, but I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to make disciples. You don't get, okay, let me back this up. If we look back a year ago when 2020 hit and you understand that your responsibility is to grow as Christian disciples and to mature in your faith. Remember, we've talked about this before. If a child isn't maturing, we take him to the doctor because something's wrong. But if we're not maturing in our faith, nobody really says anything except Paul. <laughs> And so if we were to look back a year from now, you should be more mature in your faith than you were a year ago, are you? Remember, we talk about the thing that faith leaves evidence. Evidence is the telltale signs, the indicators by which we can see the manifest presence of God growing inside of you and changing you. How, what's the evidence in your life? How has it transformed your relationship with your friends, with your spouse, with your kids, with your family, your relationship with God? Your hunger and your desire to spend time in the Word, your prayer life, your Godfidence, right? All of that should be growing, and your moment of self-examination is, okay, a year ago, am I more mature in my faith is my spiritual life grown in me? Is there a difference? Is there tangible evidence of my maturity from what I was a year ago? Now, here's the statement that I had to preface just a little bit. You don't get a mulligan because of COVID. COVID doesn't give you a mulligan. So, God isn't going to look at you someday after you die and go to heaven and go, okay, you know that 2020, you didn't really grow very much, but yeah, don't worry about it. It was COVID. It was all fine. God's not going to say that. And you realize when I say that, I love you, right? <laughs> But you're responsible for your own maturity. And whether you choose to be here, I am not condemning anybody for the decisions they make. And if you think that, then you're mistaken. Uh, wrong answer. <laughs> so if you are joining us online, I'm not talking to you because you're joining us online. I'm challenging you. Or if you are here, or if you have a mask, if you don't, if you're sitting six feet apart, I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about, I'm here to make disciples, remember? And so how has your spiritual maturity grown? How have you pressed in? How have you pushed forward to grow yourself? Guys, that's what's happening in the body. That's what it means to be part of a body. A body grows and matures, doesn't it? And as part of that body, we don't get to discount any one of us, any season, 
because we have a responsibility. The fact that God is talking about us right here as a body implies some things that we have to understand and get, that we have to have as foundational before we step into a conversation about learning about the spiritual gifts. I wanna learn about the spiritual gifts, I get it, but if I don't lay a foundation first, we're gonna have trouble. Does that make sense? 1st thing that we need to do as a body is get rid of a consumer mindset and embrace a discipleship mindset. What does that mean for church? Too often we transform the church away from the model that God intended because we've created this consumer mindset. We, chop, we shop for churches like we shop for clothes or tools. I go and if I don't find what I like or if it, I don't get the customer experience that I want, then I just, I, I abandon it and I go elsewhere. But a discipleship mindset says, I am hungry to look more like him. I want to be more like him. I want to get to know him. Guys, this whole scripture passage that we read talks about one thing, the head. Who's the head of the church? It's God. And our job as members of the body of Christ is to move in tandem. He directs what we do, what we think, how we say, how we act. And when we open up these gifts, we can't ever forget that we are brought into alignment with his will for us. Because what happens if we don't have that mindset is the gifts become an end in and of themselves and we forget that Christ is the body and our purpose is to bring him glory. Does that make sense? We have to maintain that mindset. We have to abandon this consumer mindset. The, the consumer mindset that talks about how I'm supposed to be fed, I'm going to church to get entertained. Guys, this is a training ground. <laughs> this is boot camp. And out there is the real world where you go out and exercise and when you come in here, we're to build each other up so that we can go out and do the things that we need to do. You won't find a consumer model for the church in scripture. I dare you to find it. Instead, you find a discipleship model. People came in, they learned, they growed, they growed, they grew. They held each other accountable. They got into each other's business. Why? Out of love, out of the purpose of helping understand each other and, and helping mature and helping hone faith. And then they activated each other. They went out as teams and took the church into the world. That's the model that we need to embrace. So if you've ever said to yourself, oh, somebody else can do it. They don't need me. I have nothing to offer. I'm just going to step back and take a break for a while. Or if you've ever thought or said, well, I'm more important than they are. I don't know why they're doing it, because I could do it better. Why do they get that job and I don't? Can you see how all of that thinking is in direct contrast to what is described in the scripture passage that we just read? All of the parts and pieces are important. The big ones, the small ones, the vulnerable ones, the weak ones, the strong ones. Every single one of them is critical to the functioning of the church in a healthy way. And it is very, very tempting. Believe me, this whole thing with Afghanistan kind of messed me up a little bit this week. My heart hurts. <laughs> and my heart hurts for what's going on in the world right now. But I got to come back to one thing for such a time as this. You are not here by accident. God chose you to be here at this moment, at this point in history for a purpose. 
Do you know what that purpose is? What an amazing opportunity <laughs> in a world that is hurting to be able to step up and step out and be the light of Christ. It's going to take all of us, every single one of us, earnestly pursuing the gifts that he's given you, relentlessly looking to grow and mature in that gift, to go out and to shine a light. Guys, when does light show the brightest? In the darkness. It's not up to us to complain because it's dark. It's up to us to grab the light and get going. And he has primed an opportunity for us to do that. You might even find yourself sometimes comparing churches, looking around our church and going, but we don't have this, we don't have this, we don't have this. And you can, if you have a consumer mindset, you might be tempted to not return anymore or to go shop for another church that meets those needs. I would challenge that mindset. I'm never going to begrudge somebody a decision they have to make. Never. God's called us up and out a number of times. However, you must sit and be open and honest in a conversation before you make that decision with the Lord and ask him, am I here for such a time as this? Because we need you. <laughs> we need you. What an amazing opportunity there is to step up and use your gifting to serve the Lord. Guys, gifting is about saying yes to God, to not just be open to what he's given you, but to use the tools. Because we see when we start opening those gifts, it doesn't stop with opening. You don't get to say, oh, cool, and set it back on the table and move on. By the fact you of opening it, you are also then looking at God and saying yes. Not only will I accept it, but I'm going to use it. I don't understand it. <laughs> it frightens me. <laughs> but you chose me specifically with this gift in this time, in this season, to use it. Why? Help me grow it. That tells me that somebody somewhere needs you and that gift activated. Gifting is about being an active participant in your own spiritual maturity. Just like the body grows up, you have to be engaged in maturing and growing your faith. And that is a moment of quiet self-reflection between you and the Holy Spirit. Where, Holy Spirit, are you going to give me an attaboy, an girl? Nice job. Well done. Where, Holy Spirit, are you going to point and say, can we work on this now? <laughs> Opening your gift is about humility and about realizing that we're better when all the parts are here. Have we functioned as a church this last year? Yeah. You know what? We've done well. But I'm going to tell you something. We're better when you're here. Why? It's not because I'm trying to have an ego and have all the seats filled. Believe me, I would love it. It's because we need you. We need you. You are needed. You have a heart and a presence and a gift and a calling and an assignment by the Spirit to be here in this time, in this place. We can't be who we are without you. We need you. Gifting is about submission to the head. It's about pursuing God and relentlessly striving to be who he needs you to be. It's about doing what you can to press in, to get close to him, to learn about him, to ask the questions. 
because he's real and he loves you and he has so much more for you. I think it's important that you understand that God is the head. You don't report to me. You don't report to Kathy Diedrich as head of our leadership chair, leadership team. You report to him. It's easy to not show up or back out if you don't feel like doing something. You can cast blame, point fingers, come up with all kinds of ways to justify not being the body that you were called to be. But at the end of the day, you stand before him. I realize this is tough to hear, but I think it's a conversation that we need to have. You stand before him. It's, you're not doing these things for me. He's the one that you answer to. He's the one that you explain. And whether you choose to worship from home or worship here or worship at six foot, none of that is on the table. The only consideration is how are you relentlessly pursuing your relationship with God and growing in spiritual maturity? That is the only question on the table. God doesn't need people who play church. He doesn't really even need people who go to church. But what he does need is people to be the church. We can't talk about spiritual gifts without understanding all of this context because once we get into understanding each of the individual gifts, one of the main things I'm going to talk to you about is there is a pattern and a process about how, why these gifts exist and how they intersect and work together. There is a, a role and a function to each gift that when they are active and moving, you have a healthy and vibrant place for people to come in and do what we just talked about, for people to be, to be brought in and received, to be introduced to the spirit of the relationship with Christ, to be washed in baptism and forgiven, and then to be grown and developed as disciples, and then to be sent back out to do their work. The gifts that God gave us are in direct... Um, they are the gifts that make that happen. It's not about me making that happen. And I hate that context of church. And I'm going to break down those walls as much as I can. It's about everybody understanding their gifts and there's a rhyme and a reason for them and there's an intentionality behind why God chose them. And I'm excited to share that with you, but we got to get the foundation first. I'm going to read one more passage of scripture to you. It's from Ephesians. I'm going to read out of chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. If you're scrolling, you were in 1 Corinthians, just keep going just a little bit. Remember A-E-I-O, Galatians. Ephesians, A-E, helps me learn. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Listen for the purpose of the church. Listen for why these gifts are being used in the church. Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the church, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in the hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in y'all. Verse 7, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, and he's quoting Psalms here, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. I'm going to jump down to verse 11. No, verse 10. He who descended is also the one who ascended. Well, never mind. Verse 11. And he himself gave, here's the gifts. 
He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the coming craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love okay that was a chunk but did you hear <laughs> the repetition of the unification of the body, the intentionality behind the gifts, the purpose behind the gifts, the expectation that we grow up in maturity, the use of the gifts for the edifying of the church. It's all right there in Ephesians. This is the context that we have to embrace and understand. And before we can step into gifts, we have to get a hold grab a hold relentlessly and not let go of the fact that you are here for a reason, you are expected to be growing, and that you are here for such a time as this. Your gift is absolutely needed. We are good, but we are better and we are whole when you are here. Next week, the end of scripture right there in 1 Corinthians, verse, chapter 12, verse 31, Paul writes kind of a mysterious verse. He says, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. So what I would have you do is read chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. Actually, that's just chapter 13. There's only 13 verses in it. And we'll talk about what Paul means by still more excellent way. We're laying the foundation behind the gifts. You have a part in being the church. Without you, we cannot be what God intended for us to be. Amen? Amen.
Would you pray with me, please? Father God, there are many who are hurting, many who are suffering right now, many who are sick in need of your care and your embrace. Father, we come before you as a church body, as a collective voice, asking your hand of healing to be on each one who needs you, Lord. Father, there are people who have struggled across the world, our brothers and sisters across the world who have struggled with hurricanes and earthquakes and with evil forces in Afghanistan that would seek to destroy your holy name. That would hurt your children there, Father. Father, we look around the world and we feel helpless to be able to do anything that makes a difference and our heart hurts for them, and out of that pain we cry out to you, not really even knowing what to say or how to pray, Father, but your word tells us that our, our groans of anguish on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ, that your spirit is able to translate those and make meaning and sense out of them and take them right to your throne room. And so, Father, it is in, in those groanings, in that shared peace and um, shared anguish <laughs> for those who are hurting, not just here in our community, Lord, in situations where we really don't even know how to help, but people around the world who just need you. And it's in these moments like this that we're reminded truly how effective and how powerful prayer actually is. And we stand on what we know and we stand on what we believe, Father, and what we know to be true is that you are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. You created the universe with a breath. And you individually, you are individual as well as corporate, which is mind blowing. You hear our individual prayer and you respond to the cry of our hearts. 
we thank you that our voices are being unified by voices across the world who are now praying on a Sunday morning for the very same things. And so, Father, we trust that you will designate a response. And Father, give us the courage if we hear your still small voice speaking to us as an individual saying, I need you to do this. Give us the courage to respond. Please join me in the prayer of the congregational prayer in the bulletin. Rekindle within me a spark of wonder of who you are and light up a flame of love in my heart that has become dim and flickering. You are my God. You have redeemed my life and set my feet on the rock of salvation. Awaken within me that spiritual fervor that only comes from you so that I may live from this day forward preoccupied with things that delight your heart that will advance your plans and purposes in my life and in the lives of those around me. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I ask for some ushers to please come forward for tithes and offerings? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father God, we just thank you for these gifts. We thank you for the gifts of the presence of your people here this morning and those worshiping with us online. We thank you that you have blessed us, that we might be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Philip, my helper, so that I don't strangle myself with my cords. Um, okay, we've got a couple of things that I want to announce. Um, look on the back of your bulletin, Women's Bible Study. We start back up Monday night, tomorrow night. Um, I've got books that will be here, so come on, join us. If you haven't let me know yet and you're interested, come on, because I always get some extra, so that's not a big deal. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. This will be a good study to do. I, we did a Priscilla Shearer recently, and, and they're amazing, so I'm looking forward to this one as well. Um, men's study Monday night. I think um, leadership team, huh? Yeah. So Monday night we're diving into Peter. So anybody that wants to come... That's what we're going to be studying. So awesome. Awesome. Yeah. They've been doing a series on the apostles. Just like, yeah. Cool. He's a good, he's a good one to look. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Um, leadership meeting Wednesday night at 630 here at the church, right, Kathy? Um, anything else that I am missing? Okay, I do have a couple of announcements. I'm thoroughly going to embarrass her, but today's my mom's birthday. So you wish her happy birthday. <laughs> and with her, my Aunt Patty and my Aunt Judy and my Uncle Mark. And um, I'm going to give you a minute just to say something about them if you would like. But my Aunt Judy makes Anglican prayer beads. And she gave me a bunch of them yesterday and said, why don't you take them to church and see if anybody wants them? She's got a bunch more at home, evidently. But they're in the back. They are free for the taking. Um, if you'd like to take one home and maybe you've like, like say if you want to take one home to your mom, you can take one. There's a little card back there that kind of explains. Is there anything you want to add to t about them? You can go online and look it up. Yep. Yeah. Okay. You can go online and look up Christian prayer beads. Um, I've got lots of sets at home, one in my car and my office and different places like that. So they're really cool. So they're compliments of my Aunt Judy and Uncle Mark. Um, anything else? Okay. Kayla, we're still waiting. Yep. She's like, me too. <laughs> we're still waiting. Ah, dun, 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 downhill slide. <laughs> the sooner the better, right? <laughs> All right, would you stand in worship as we go home? 
bless you this week. Have a great week, everyone. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be.